Okay, so I want to talk about how light interacts with matter, because this is uh, really important to interpreting the light we see from space, because space isn't completely empty. There's stuff out there. Um, we'll talk about exactly what kind of stuff in more detail next time, but one of the materials that we are most interested in is gas. So different um, atoms uh, of gas in space lie between the stars. And so some starlight is filtered through that gas, that interstellar gas. And so in order to understand how light interacts with gases, uh, the first point is that gases only absorb specific wavelengths and the wavelengths that they absorb depend on their composition. So in my cartoon of my gas cloud here, I've got some uh, atom variety A, which is blue, atom variety B is orange, and this is just color coding to show which uh, wavelengths they're gonna absorb. So if I try to shine violet light through my cloud of gas, it'll just pass right through. The violet light is not specific to either of those atoms, and so those atoms do not absorb violet light. If I pass orange light through though, then any time that one of those light photons, we, we think of light as a wave, but we also think of it as kind of discrete packets. Um, anytime one of those light photons hits one of my atoms, then the atom has a chance to absorb the light. It won't absorb it 100% of the time, but it will absorb it with a certain probability um, based on its um, atomic species or molecular species. These orange guys look like they're actually molecules to me. All right, so when I finally pass all of my orange light through this gas cloud, only one of my photons escaped unscathed. All right, so what happens if I pass um, a spectrum of light through my gas cloud, right? Something that's uh, a full visible spectrum, maybe from a star like our sun. Well, in that case, uh, my blue photon is gonna get absorbed. My orange photon is going to get absorbed, but everything else emerges. And of course, there's not just one single photon of light per star that comes out. There's lots and lots of them, and they're produced in different amounts. Uh, if my star is cooler, I'll have more red photons. If my star is hotter, I'll have more blue and violet photons. And so uh, the specifics of how gas uh, absorbs the light from a star will depend both on the source of light and on the gas that is in between. So I'm going to try to break these two factors apart. All right. Um, when we have a continuous spectrum, like a rainbow that we get from a prism, and we pass that through a gas, then uh, the continuous spectrum is produced just by the source. So this is, you know, this light is produced by the source. And then the specific um, atoms or molecules within the gas, they take away some of the light because they absorb it. And so we end up with dark lines in our spectrum. And now this is called an absorption spectrum because some of the light has been absorbed by the gases uh, in between. So the absorption spectrum, the location of all these dark bars, that depends on what kind of atoms and molecules are in my gas. But the overall amount of light in my spectrum, that depends on my source. So remember, we, could, we can look at this um, spectrum as a you know, rainbow smear, but we can also look at it as a black body spectrum. And when we do that, then the absorption lines look like dips in my black body spectrum. So in this case, this is the black body spectrum just of my source. This corresponds with my little rainbow um, cartoon for the continuous spectrum. And if there's no gas in between the source and me, then I just see the full spectrum of the source. But if there is gas, then there are little dips where some of the light has been removed as it's been absorbed by the gas. And so if I try to correlate the black body spectrum, the energy per wavelength with the um, absorption cartoon, then those dips will happen at specific colors based on which gases are present in the cloud. So these two representations give us different information. 
This barcode style one is useful if we just want a kind of snapshot ID of what gases are in, in the cloud. But the black body is more useful if we want to figure out where is that peak wavelength so I can learn about the temperature of the source. All right, let me give you another example here. Um, so if I have a different source, then my black body spectrum will be different, but my dips will occur at the same place, right? So if I have these two different sources, so two different stars, this star is cooler. So it has a peak at a longer wavelength, but the absorption dips happen at the same location because the gas in the cloud is the same for both stars. So let's say I was looking at Orion and there's you know some cloud of gas. This one could be the red star Betelgeuse. This one could be the blue star Rigel, but I'm gonna get the same barcode pattern because the same cloud of gas is between both of the stars in that constellation. All right, so now I've got temperature from the peak wavelength. And now I can learn a new piece of information, which is what kind of gases are between me and that source by looking at the absorption spectrum. So now we've got two things we're learning from the light that we receive. Okay, well, I already told you this, but let's just do it again anyway. Which of these sources is hotter? So if I take the peak wavelength for A, it winds up near the blue or purple. Um, B is shifted farther to the red. So A is in this higher um, energy part of the spectrum. So that's from a hot source, whereas B is from a, a cooler, a lower energy part of the spectrum. So it's from a cooler source. Thank you. All right. So indeed, A is hotter. And um, this, so a higher temperature means a lower peak wavelength. By lower, I mean shorter peak wavelength. I try not to say higher or lower with wavelength. I like longer and shorter because it's a distance measurement, but sometimes I mess up. Okay, so one more time. If we now have, um, if we look at the shape of the curve here, we can tell that each of these black body curves is coming from the same source. So here's the source with no gas, here's the source with one kind of gas, and now here's a different gas, but with the same source. The overall curve shape is the same, but now the dips are different, right? If we look at the barcode pattern, then we can quickly identify that, oh, this one has five dips, this one only has four dips, and they're occurring at different wavelengths. That must mean that this gas has a different composition than this gas, a different mix of atoms and molecules of different kinds. All right, so this is what we can get from our absorption spectrum quite easily. All right, so um, cool gases produce absorption spectra. And this has a flip side. Um, once that light is absorbed, it's not just held onto by those atoms and molecules forever. Eventually, they re-emit the light, but it can only um, re-emit the colors that it originally absorbed. So the same exact energy of light goes in as goes out. And that's what um, makes sure that energy is conserved in that interaction. So what does this look like? Well, let's say that I had my gas cloud and when I shined orange light through it, these four molecules absorbed that orange light. Now, when those uh, re-emit the light, they will do so in every direction, in random directions. Each one will re-emit in a random direction because the molecules are just kind of floating around, rotating, and when they re-emit the light, it'll just go in one particular direction. So on average, it will be just sent in every direction spherically out from the gas cloud. And only the colors that were absorbed will be re-emitted by those particular molecules. All right, so there goes my orange light. If it happens that I have two different species and both of them happen to absorb light in the same direction where I've got a prism. And then I gather the spectrum from that gas cloud that I'm looking at in that direction. Then I would, uh, I would detect those as bright lines on a dark background. So I would not uh, see any other light except the light that's being emitted 
by those two different species. So I would see one blue bar, one orange bar from both of those, uh, the atom and the molecule here. So this now is called an emission spectrum because we're measuring the uh, lines that are emitted by the gas or the molecule. And so what that would look like if we plotted it in the same way that we plot the black body spectra with energy per wavelength is they would look like um, peaks instead of dips. So they would correspond exactly to the location of the absorption dips um, that we saw from the previous example, but now they are spikes instead of dips. All right, so you can um, observe different types of spectra based on where you're located relative to a source and the cloud of gas. So let's say that astronomer A is on planet A, astronomer B is on planet B, and so they have different angles on this gas cloud that this star is shining through. Which one of these astronomers would see an emission spectrum? All right, so I'm seeing most votes for A, but still a small contingent for B. Um, so let me show you how I think of this. Um, if I have, you know, some light from the source, I just care about the one that's going kind of in a straight line toward this cloud. And then um, astronomer B is seeing the light through the cloud. And so the, the um, light that they receive is being removed from the cloud. So that's not an emission spectrum. But astronomer A, they're seeing the light that the gas is scattering in all directions. They're not pointed directly at the source, right? So if they were pointed directly at the source here, if they pointed their telescope that direction, they would see um, the same type of spectrum that astronomer B saw, but they're not. They're, they're looking at an angle. So they're only seeing the light that the gas has absorbed and then re-emitted in all directions. So they are seeing the emission spectrum. So a related question is, um, what type of spectrum does this astronomer see? All right, I see the most votes for A, the absorption spectrum, and that's exactly right. So if the cloud was not there and they were just looking directly at the star, then they would see a continuous spectrum. But because the cloud is there, some of the light will be absorbed by the molecules and atoms in the cloud at characteristic wavelengths, depending on the composition. And so this astronomer will see an absorption spectrum as a result.